Well, as uh, most people have become aware, uh, Ron Paul is uh, getting some heat uh, now that he is doing well in the polls and looks to be well situated to do well in both Iowa and New Hampshire and who knows from there. And so he's getting the scrutiny that I think uh, people figured he didn't have a chance so they didn't really do it or deserve to be looked at that, that thoroughly. And this is good. I'm glad that he's uh, perceived as enough of a threat by the establishment that they need to attack him. And uh, it's also perfectly fair game and legitimate. I mean, I'm a huge Ron Paul fan. Uh, I think he's the most extraordinary American politician, at least since, I don't know, the uh, founding father's generation. But uh, he, that does not mean he is above scrutiny. He should be scrutinized by everyone, most of all by his supporters. And people who aren't his supporters, uh, it's totally justifiable for them to look at him. Now, when it comes to Ron Paul uh, and with any politician, there's two things you can look at them. And you can criticize them either for their policies or for their personality. And, and to an extent, the two are merged. And with Paul, it seems that uh, there's a much greater willingness to attack him for his personality uh, than for his policies. Uh, because nobody wants to debate his policy issues. The Republicans do not want to have, for different reasons, the Republicans do not want to have a serious debate about foreign policy. Uh, they don't want to have to seriously defend their absurd claims that Iran is about to start another Holocaust or is, would e instantly nuke uh, Israel were to acquire a nuclear weapon, assuming it was even attempting to do so. Uh, they don't want to have to argue uh, that we need to have as many military bases as we are, that we need to increase the military um, defense budget all the time, uh, that we need a police state, that we need the TSA, that we need no-knock raids. They don't want to argue that uh, their position, which is that uh, Americans should be able to be thrown in prison forever without trial or even charges uh, on the whim of the president. They don't want to make that argument. Now, liberals don't want to seriously question the welfare state because most liberals... Uh, really believe that the uh, the height, the, the pinnacle of human civilization is a welfare state that takes the most care of people possible. Now, they, they might differ in exactly how expansive they want that. They might not all want cradle to grave. They may only want cradle to teenager, then from, or, you know, cradle to college, and then retirement to grave, or, you know, something like that. But they regard a welfare state as... Uh, an end in itself is totally worthwhile or perhaps they think it's just good policy and they don't want to have a debate about Social Security being bankrupt they don't want to have a debate about rising costs and falling quality uh, in government services whether they be health care uh, or defense or anything they don't want to have that debate so what they what both sides would rather do is attack Paul for his personality and this is also relatively difficult because the guy is kind of boring I mean he, he's been married to the same woman for more than 50 years and they met in high school and he was a doctor and he delivered babies for a long time and I mean uh, he's been extremely consistent in his positions and so there's not a whole lot to go on and the thing that has really kind of come up are are these newsletters that uh, were published under his name uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, basically in the interregnum between his uh, first two congressional stints. He had a very short congressional stint, I think for only six months, and the two years later was elected in the late 70s, a seat he held until, I don't know, I want to say maybe 1988, and then he didn't get back into Congress until 1996. And in, in the interim, uh, he was kind of like the only politician in America, as he still almost is, uh, to have a consistent constitutional minarchist position and so he had a constituency even when he wasn't in Congress and so he he profited off of this by publishing this newsletter and so people are looking at this and saying look at now as far as I've not read uh, the entirety of his newsletters in fact I've heard that they're quite voluminous but the the sections that are repeatedly quoted I've seen this same couple passages um, uh, quoted repeatedly so my guess is that these are either the most damning or the only damning ones or they're the only damning or most damning ones that have been found so far my guess is that there aren't any reporters who have seriously looked through the whole thing so who knows there might be something that's even worse that would come up at some point now 
reading them, they are not policy statements. None of them advocate things like a return to Jim Crow or laws against gays or anything like that. So they, they don't strike me as something that you could look and say, okay, policy-wise, this is bad, this is bad policy. Uh, what it would say, though, is, okay, the people who make this, who, the, the sta these statements are racist or bigoted in some way to some degree. Uh, although I think some of them, I mean, one of them said that blacks are fleet of foot. It's not really a, that's kind of a compliment, maybe a little left-handed, but it's not exactly like, a and I've, I've heard it said that there's no way Ron Paul would have written that, because if anyone looks at his history, he actually is a very fast runner, at least he used to be. He set a state, uh, state record that was only like a tenth of a second less than Jesse Owens. Uh, so he, he probably would not have considered your average black to be, uh, that fast. But anyway, uh, it does raise questions about his personality, but I think these should be allow allied if he didn't actually write them. And I think the evidence is that he didn't. Uh, Ron Paul uses ghostwriters quite a bit. Uh, he didn't have a byline in these. Uh, it's not exactly a secret that uh, Lou Rockwell either wrote these or hired the person who did. If I had to guess, I would just say it sounds like it could be Gary North. Gary North although I like Gary North, is, I mean, he's a very strong evangelical and wouldn't surprise me if a lot of this uh, was originated from him and he'd written stuff for Paul before. Uh, the fact that Paul published it anyway, uh, you could hold that against him, I suppose, but, I mean, like I said, they're voluminous, he was a busy guy, and they're not that bad. It's not like it's calling for any kind of legislative thing. It's... You know, people are allowed to be bigots, and they're allowed to say bigoted things. And uh, if I would be more concerned if he had a, a legislative rec record uh, that indicated that he wanted to institute policies like this, but his his legislative record is extremely clear, and it is that he would never ever do something like that. He never has, and he's spoken against it. So uh, there's that. Now, uh, among homosexuals, uh, there's a lot of uh, hesitation uh, about Paul for a couple of reasons and uh, I think I understand part of some of these reasons and there are probably others that I don't. Uh, one is the fact that he opposes uh, subsidizing uh, homosexual marriage, gay marriage. Uh, he doesn't think that it should be recognized by the state. Now his counter to that is that the state shouldn't recognize any marriage. The state shouldn't be involved in marriage, period. And when I say the state, I mean the federal government and the state governments, too, for that matter. And this is seen as anathema to a lot of people. And I think I, the reason why is understandable, but uh, it ignores the point that Paul is making, and the very valid and important point that Paul is making. Uh, analogy here would be with tariffs. Uh, there is a sugar tariff in the United States. All of us pay about triple what we normally would for sugar. And so we're directly made poorer for that fact, and that goes for everything that sugar goes into as well, which is almost everything you eat. Uh, and there's ancillary problems even on top of that. So uh, pop manufacturers, soda, cola manufacturers, uh, don't use sugar because it's so expensive, and so they use corn syrup instead. The problem is you need triple the corn syrup to get the same amount of sweetness. So pop is actually more fattening than it otherwise would be. So we all pay a very high price for sugar and the re but the sh the few sugar plantations in Florida and Louisiana in the United States they benefit they they make millions and millions of dollars off this tariff every year and this is clearly an injustice it's not fair that they would be granted this special subsidy and the rest of us get made poor just so they can have a better living and so you might look at say a potato farmer or a beet farmer and they could say look this is not fair. He has this tariff. He's getting all this money. I have to compete with potatoes and beets from all over the world and, you know, whatever. And at this point, when faced with this injustice, you basically have two egalitarian uh, avenues you could pursue. One would be to say we should eliminate the subsidy so that sugar doesn't have a tariff and they have to compete just like everybody else. And uh, Or you could say... I want my industry to also have a subsidy, so let's have a tariff on potatoes or beets or whatever it is that you that you favor. Now, the latter option is clearly worse. The latter option means that uh, 
now all of this will pay more not only for sugar but for tariffs and beets or whatever uh, we will all be made poorer they're still going to pay a high price for sugar and now everyone else is going to pay a high par price for whatever else has been tariffed the, the first option to just remove the subsidy is by far well will all be wealthier the sugar people uh, will lose some money but they are after all a minority why should one minority just be given a huge subsidy at the expense of everybody else and many of them will have to change their ways it's a waste to have sub-marginal uh, production of a good, those resources should be used for something else. The United States is not the best place to grow sugar. There's only a few places where it's even possible, and there are other places in the world that are so much better at it that it doesn't make sense to waste our time trying to grow sugar. Canada could try and grow nutmeg if it wanted. It could spend billions and billions of dollars and make artificial greenhouses and try and grow nutmeg, but it just doesn't make any sense because there are other places in the world where nutmeg grows naturally and can do it for pennies on the dollar compared to what they could do it in Canada. So there's no reason that uh, we, should, we should always go to get rid of the subsidy, not to create another subsidy, because then we're all making ourselves poorer. And I think the problem with gays, the, the politically active gays, is that too many of them have organized with a singular goal of gaining that subsidy. So I don't know the history, if there was ever a point where within the homosexual movement people were saying okay we need to get the state out of marriage uh, you could always have made that case it would have been good because the state got into marriage to prevent miscegenation to prevent race mixing uh, which is disgusting and it's it's very creepy that the state would be involved in marriages anyway uh, I don't as far as I'm aware nobody in the homosexual movement ever seriously considered that option I don't know if it's because they weren't aware of it or if they th considered it and they didn't think it was going to be as good and so uh, the entire movement, as far as political activism is concerned, is geared towards garnering these privileges for their group. And when Ron Paul says he doesn't want to give those privileges, even when he you know, elaborates that he wants to get rid of the subsidies for everybody so there wouldn't be special rights uh, for heterosexual marriage, it is kind of viewed as being a case of he's getting down on us, he's trying to deny us something that we what we really want. But I would I would say that you should and, and this is difficult because uh, what, what I'm asking is that you consider the possibility that maybe it's better to not have Leviathan than to try and get Leviathan on your side. And this is especially true if you are a minority. Alright, now there's a lot of debate as to what percentage of the population is gay. And usually I hear it's two or three percent. And I know that there are some uh, people who have proposed much higher amounts. And of course, then there's always the argument that, you know, it's not gay or straight. There's a spectrum and, you know, we're all probably all a little bit of one or the other. Uh, and, but clearly a majority of people are not gay. And I've heard that uh, the, the maximum estimates I've heard are like 15 or 20 percent. Well, in a democracy where you have a government that can do basically anything as long as it has a majoritarian mandate, 20, 15 or 20 percent means that you are doomed, doomed to uh, political, uh, to, to, to being out of power. You're doomed to be uh, at the mercy of the majority all the time. So it is very wise to consider the possibility that maybe we shouldn't have uh, a majoritarian tyranny that can do whatever the majority wants. What Paul is offering you, what he offers this entire country, not just to gays, and not just to blacks, and not just to whites, and not just to millionaires, and not just to poor people, is the idea that uh, you will be free from the impositions of others to the degree that he can grant that, which actually Ron Paul can do to a much greater degree than people tell him to think. Now, I have heard this argument made and the retort has usually been that's all well and good hypothetically I agree with you it does it is fair to have the government not subsidize anybody but I'm concerned with the fact that there's no way we're gonna undo the heterosexual subsidies so we've got to go ahead and just accept that accept that draconian evil fascist uh, policy and try and just get a cut ourselves uh, one, there's a couple problems with that. One is it's assuming that nothing can ever change, at which point slavery should have never ended. 
you know, women's suffrage should never have come about. Uh, the war should never end. I mean, they're, they're, you're, 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 you're just dooming yourself to accept the status quo. And the other thing is, is if we're all fighting uh, to get a subsidy for our group, whatever that is, uh, we are guaranteed to be engaged in, in warfare. And the thing with, with gay people is you are a minority. So your democratic contest to get what you want is going to cause a backlash. And obviously, we've seen that. There's been a huge anti-gay backlash uh, from people who are against the so-called gay agenda, however invalid that characterization may even be. Uh, and the, the, the point is, is that the anti-gays or the people who aren't gay at the very least or, sim or not sympathetic to, to gay gayness uh, are going to outnumber gays. And so they're going to have an electoral and democratic advantage that can never be overcome. Uh, and I think society can change and become more accepting of homosexuals, and I believe that it is. I mean, I don't know very many conservatives who are really hard up against gay people. There's a few, and I know very, very few young people. I know a lot of young people who are conservative, who, th who believe in minarchism, who want a small small government, but they then don't go, oh, we got to stop those, those gays. Uh, there's not very many people like that, and that's not because the government's forcing uh, integration in any way. It's because just people are getting to know more, people are being more open, they're seeing it. That's the real change. If you try and use political power to further your ends, your people who disagree with you are going to mobilize against you. And so you're, who, who wins, we don't know, but there's going to be a fight. And the fight's not going to help either side. It's only going to embitter both sides. Now, coming back to Ron Paul, I've been a fan of Ron Paul, a big fan, since about 2003. And I've watched, I don't know, thousands of clips of him giving speeches on the floor of the house, uh, giving uh, lectures on uh, C-SPAN, giving regular lectures. I've read his books. And I defy anybody to find him saying anything that could be construed as anti-gay, anti-homosexual, or anti-black, or racist for that matter. He never does. He has a couple issues that he really cares a great deal about. And those are empire and economics, the big two. And as far, as far as I'm aware, those issues which make up the vast majority of his public statements are could never ever be construed as being anti-gay. Uh, giving, giving us a gold standard or having a market con competing currencies, I don't see how that could be called anti-gay relative to uh, inflationism in the Fed. I don't see how ending the wars in the empire could be anti-gay either. Uh, I just don't see the link. And that's, that's, those two together, that's probably 80-85% of his, you know, what, what he talks about whenever he's on TV. I've never seen him talk about the gay agenda. We've got to stop the gays. These newsletters that he did not write do, in some cases, talk about that. Not very often, though. Like, they're, they're pretty big. There's only a few little messages, and it's not about we got to stop and we got to get elected and have Michelle Bachman be president. No, I, I don't. I don't. He, he's very clearly not. Not. It's not an issue. Even if he is secretly a homophobe, which there's no evidence that, that he is really. Uh, that it, it seems like it would be irrelevant even if he was, because that's not the the thrust of his argument. I also point out when he was on Jay Leno just a few weeks ago, uh, Jay Leno asked him what he thought about the other candidates. And the point of a question like that is for Paul to both differentiate himself from the other candidates and to show why those differences, why he is preferable to them. And so, uh, asked about Bachman and Santorum, uh, how did he differentiate himself? He said, uh, she hates gays, or he, he said that Santorum hates gays. She said, and Bachman hates Muslims. Now, if he also hated gays, why would he point that out as something that differentiate differentiate himself from Santorum or Bachman? It wouldn't make any sense. And the other thing is, if it, if he thought it was a difference, but it was an irrelevant difference that the voters shouldn't care about, why would he point it out? The only logical answer is that he thinks it's a difference, and he thinks that it makes him look better to be not anti-gay. Now, I have heard it alleged that. Well, he's just now talking like he's not anti-gay and that he's not a bigot because he, you know, he wants to fool us all. This 
really strains credulity for uh, one big reason. Ron Paul receives an unbelievably huge amount of negative press and negative attacks because of his positions on, on numerous issues. Number one is his foreign policy. He's running in a Republican primary when all the other candidates are hawks who they only differentiate as how soon are they going to attack Iran. That's the only difference. And how, how, how big they want to expand Guantanamo. How big do they, how many more Americans do they want to throw in prison without trial? And, and how many more predator drones do they want to use to kill innocent people in third world countries? That's the difference between the other Republicans. And then you have him come out there and say, war is bad, I want peace, nobody should even have nuclear weapons. If Iran gets them, we understand why they would want them for self-defense. We're not going to go to war. We went, the last time we went to war in Iraq, it was a whole bunch of lies, which everybody knows. And why we're not, we should not fall for that again with Iran. They're not trying to get a nuclear weapon. There's no evidence to that effect. Israel can take care of themselves. They don't need our help. We shouldn't be a fait accompli. We get in trouble because of the things Israel does, and Israel should deal with that themselves. He says that, and he gets enormous, enormous problems with this. And there's a big part of the Republican base who just think that he is a loon and crazy for believing in peace and believing in the Founding Fathers' non-interventionist foreign policy. He, that, to him, is the big problem. If he was going to lie, if he was going to change his message and his statements to make himself more electable, well, I have news for you, for gay people. Uh, unfortunately, gay people are not such an important voting block, especially in a Republican primary, that he has any reason to kowtow to them. In fact, the fact that he would imply that Bachman is bad or, or Santorum is bad for being anti-gay probably hurts him with uh, primary voters, Republican primary voters. It doesn't help him. So I don't think it makes any sense to say that he is now acting unbigoted so he can court the homosexual vote. Homosexual vote does not factor into him until after he gets the nomination, and even then, not very much. Uh, and I would extend this uh, even more than uh, after foreign policy, the, his biggest issues are going to be economics and the drug war. He's against the drug war, and for many social conservatives, uh, that's anathema. That means he wants little kids to take heroin or whatever, and he, he does it. Now, a lot of very... It's interesting because, you know, people have said when Iowa is coming up and it doesn't matter if he wins because Pat Robertson won there and Huckabee won there. And it's true that Pat, Pat Robertson and Huckabee are like fundamentalist Christian fascists. I don't know about Robertson as well, but Huckabee definitely is. And so, you know, if there's a certain crowd in Iowa, but in the Republican Party generally, that if you come and you're a Bible thumper, uh, they're going to just, they're really going to go for you in a big way. And people say, well, he's going to win Iowa or he could. And so uh, doesn't that imply that he's just a Bible thumper? Ron Paul, as far as I can tell, is a religious Christian. But he's not a Bible thumper. He does not talk about religion all that much. In fact, I've, his statements are usually that your religion should be in the closet. I'm not a theologian. But I don't know what the basis for him saying that is. But that I've heard him say it, that your, your religion should be, quote, in the closet. Uh, he is not a Bible thumper. He is a peacemonger and a free market advocate. That is what he is. And a lot of evangelicals really like him because he will leave them alone to homeschool their kids. They know that he will not force them to take vaccines. He knows he will not force them to do communist, socialist things that they don't like. He's not going to bring about you know, 666 uh, RFID chips or any of this other uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic stuff that a lot of Christians are really worried about. Uh, he's not the Antichrist. He's not. Uh, he's he's going to let them homeschool, and and they really really agree with him on that. And the founding fathers, a lot of them, although it's not a hundred percent correlation. And the thing is, you may not like a lot of those evangelical Christians, and I may not like a lot of those evangelical Christians. But to be perfectly honest. Uh, they have a right to their opinion and you have a right to theirs. So you can call them bigoted, closed-minded people and they can say that you're a sodomite with a, a ticket to hell. And we're all big boys. We can take it. Uh, they think that that's... I mean, that doesn't mean that we can't vote for the person that they also support because the whole point in having liber a libertarian candidate to having a libertarian offer is that one group doesn't have to have political power over the other one. We should get along, and if we can't, we should disassociate with each other, and that's the best that we can do. To try and 
coerce each other through the state guarantees that we will fight and that we will become even more embittered towards each other. So it is true that if you go to a Ron Paul meeting, you may well encounter people you don't like. I know I've done that. I've gone to Ron Paul meetings. There are a whole bunch of big nappy-haired hippies, uh, you know, who are just there to legalize pot or whatever, which is fine. I mean, pot should be legalized, but you know, they're not my type of person. But that's okay. We can get along for this. And the other thing that needs to be said, it shouldn't have to be said. Let's assume that he does have deep down inside, he really is a homophobe and he really doesn't like gay people and whatever. And that even though he's never really made statements to that effect, and apparently he doesn't care very much about it one way or the other. Uh, the other Republican candidates and Obama are butchers, are butchers, okay? Obama has killed thousands and thousands of people in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Uganda, in Libya, uh, soon probably in Syria, hopefully not, but possibly in Iran, uh, on and on and on. Obama. And, I, and I, I'm using Obama here not because he's worse, because the other Republicans are worse than Obama. Besides Paul, the other Republicans are even worse than Obama. And if Paul is not the nominee, I would rather see Obama be reelected than have any of the other Republicans be elected. I'm, I'm not one of those anybody but Obama. I, I hate Obama. I prefer him to Bachman or Santorum or Gingrich or Romney or Perry or Santorum uh, or Kane for that matter. Huntsman, we're not, that's not even, that's an outlier. Let's not talk about him. Okay. Obama goes around, he, he kills American citizens, not only without a trial, but without even charging them with a crime for doing the alleged things that Anwar al-Awlaki did are perfectly legal in the United States. It is legal to support Al-Qaeda verbally. It is legal to say, I agree with what Al-Qaeda is doing. Good for them. That's First Amendment. There have been many, many cases in the history of the United States where people have voiced support for terrorist organizations that have gone out and killed people, and the Supreme Court has said that that's, that's First Amendment protected. Now, it's a different if you come and say, okay, let's here's our plan, this is what we're going to do, then that's conspiracy to commit the crime or whatever. But to just advocate it, generally is fine. But even if he had done something wrong, he should be charged with a crime. So we have Obama killing people, American citizens, although that shouldn't matter, just killing anybody is just as bad as killing an American citizen. Uh, but now he wants to throw people in prison forever without trial. Uh, and we have Lindsey Graham and Carl Levin and John McCain and most of the Senate and most of the House to thank for that. And to say, well, yes, Maybe Obama does these bad things, but I think that rhetorically he's pro-gay enough that I much prefer him to somebody like Ron Paul, who even though he's pro-peace and he doesn't want to throw people in prison, he believes in the Bill of Rights and civil liberties more so than anybody else. I think he's secretly deep down a homophobe, so I'm going to vote for Obama instead. Now, all I can say to that, if that's your position, is that your priorities are extremely messed up. This is very similar to the liberals out there who will say, Yes, he's killing people. Yes, he's a dictator, uh, you know, but I think he's going to give welfare to poor people. I favor that, so he has my vote. I would ask, please, to consider the possibility that maybe Paul would be the lesser of the two evils in that case. And that's granting that he's actually secretly a homophobe, which I am positive he is not. All right, he has a lot of gay supporters, and he knows this, and he meets them, and he doesn't, like, shun and run away and oh, oh, get out of get out of my face and he doesn't he doesn't he's not disavowed you know one of his biggest supporters is Justin Romando who is gay who runs antiwar.com uh, and you know Ron Paul has has a couple times had to say well I got money from somebody usually like uh, a white nationalist and, and says well I disavow their views and I you know they gave me money so whatever like I'm not going to give it back, but that doesn't mean I. Ser but he never comes out and says, "Man, I, Justin Romando, he's he's a fag, and I don't like him, and so uh, please disassociate me with him." No, he never. <laughs> he's never disavowed in any way anything that any homosexual has ever said that was good to him. Uh, so uh, I know that it's actually a bit of a stretch because if you have a worldview of of Leviathan of wanting the government to come and intercede in social affairs. Uh, that it's asking a lot to change your philosophy to support this guy, which you should at very least consider the possibility that maybe a big democratic government is not good for you. So even if you won, even if you got what you wanted, 
you're only waiting until the day when the majority turns against you for whatever reason. And, you know, the thing is, when majorities turn against minorities, there usually isn't really a good reason to do it. It's usually some kind of scapegoat, which means no, no amount of genuine innocence is really a, a guarantee. So, like, the Jews in Germany were, were genuinely innocent. They weren't trying to ru ruin the country. They weren't trying to take it over and, and you know, spread their uh, lies or whatever, and their, their currency to run. Jews weren't trying to do that, but it didn't matter because they became the scapegoats. So gays don't have to have an agenda. They don't have to be secretly trying to convert all the little boys out there. And you could still be turned on by the majority, which is always going to be a possibility. So you should be hesitant, at the very least, to rush in and support a majoritarian government. At the very least, you should be hesitant. And you should be receptive to the idea that maybe dissolving the power of the state at least a great deal, maybe not all the way, although there's an argument there as well, uh, you should at least consider that there, maybe there is merit to that. And then beyond that, if you are unwilling to do that, if you cannot become a minarchist, if you are uh, too ingrained in the idea of having a government, then at least consider the possibility that Ron Paul would be a far, far less evil president than any other candidate, even those who might nominally have uh, pro-homosexual rhetoric, like Obama. You know, I'm sure Obama will never say anything bad about homosexuals. He'll just throw them in prison forever when he decides that they are against him. Which, I almost forgot, he is doing to Bradley Manning right now. I guess he is being charged with a crime. Bradley Manning, a hero who happens to be gay, who told the truth about the government's lies, Obama is going after him like he's Timothy McVeigh, like he killed, like he's the one who was killing people, not the psychopaths in the helicopter or whoever ordered them to do. Obama is attacking him, Bradley Manning, somebody that Ron Paul has come out vocally in support of, but he's gay. I mean, if, if Ron Paul is secretly gay, or anti-gay and a homophobe, why would he endorse and support Bradley Manning? Like he just did like a few days ago in a speech. And he's done it before. So consider that maybe the nominally pro-gay but actually fascistic dictator Obama, who admittedly is not as bad as the other Republican candidates, even assuming that Ron Paul was secretly a homophobe, for which there is no evidence, and actually a great deal of counter evidence, just assume that Ron Paul is still the man to elect. He's still vastly superior and preferable. So uh, it is my hope that that happens. Now, as, as far as the Republican primaries go, it probably doesn't help that much. If you want to register as a Republican to vote for him, fine. Uh, but when it comes to the general election, which it may, people keep saying he's not going to be get the nominee, and I said that for a long time as well. And now I don't know. He, I, I still think he has long odds, but it's definitely a possibility. Uh, don't, don't be so easily vote bought by flowery rhetoric, which, when taken as a whole with the rest of the package offered by someone like Obama, is still fascism. You know, even if it's not overtly anti-gay fascism unless the gay person happens to you know question the government then then you might get a predator drone to kill you uh, so and God forbid there are any gays in uh, Iran because we'll be killing them I know that the Iranians occasionally execute homosexuals it's my understanding it's it's pretty rare obviously that's despicable but we were to actually go to war in Iran we would probably kill like many times more in just a day or two than the Iranian government ever has uh, so, anyway, that's my, my appeal, that's my, my argument, uh, be similar to the argument for being uh, pro him if you're black or minority, which he is the most popular Republican among minorities. I don't know if there's any such statistic among gays. I'm sure he's the most popular Republican among gays. I, mean, I, I actually know quite a few gay Republicans, and some of them are just big fat neocon warmongers. But most of them were actually pretty good libertarians. And obviously Ron Paul's their man. He's my man. If you're gay, he should be your man. Uh, in, uh, it sounds bad, in a, in a political sense. So I hope for those of you who have misgivings about him that you will consider the possibility that he's offering you a great deal more 
than just a, a new flavored politician for this election cycle because he certainly is.